So hello everyone, I'm Chris and I'm here to, to talk about dependency injection and bust some of the most common myths uh, about it. So I strongly believe that this design pattern which is very common in other languages, especially oriented uh, object-oriented patterns, but uh, design languages, but not only. It's often misunderstood and mis, uh, misused in C++. So I will try to discuss the benefits of it and potential use cases for it. It's actually a case study, so we'll take a look into that. So, so it's actually so misunderstood that, sorry for that, but I have to clarify that, mm -hmm. that this talk is not about CMake or dependency management. So just without further, uh, let's, let's begin. So what's the motivation and goal for, for this talk? It's basically to increase the number of attendees, developers in C++ who are willing to use and try DI, assuming that not everyone is using DI, uh, which is the shortcut for dependency injection. So let's assume that there is a talk about DI at CP now. Well, is actually happening as we speak. Uh, and there's a number of attendees greater than zero. Assuming the speaker is an attendee, uh, I checked that already. But thank you for coming either way. And there are attendees who are not using the eye, or not, you know, have bad experience with the eye, don't know what is the eye, yeah, half of the audience. The attendees who are thinking that this talk is still about CMake? No. Kind of, that's good. OK, so the talk has been given by the speaker, so it's happening. Uh, that's the word. So, so, so the final goal is that the number of attendees, you guys and girls and attendees and developers all the, around the world, will be more willing to use the eye afterwards. So that's the goal. Let's keep that in mind. We'll see how it will go. I will try to convince you that DI is not that scary. It's quite useful if applied correctly, though. OK. So quick agenda outline. In order to talk about uh, DI, we have to talk about design a bit, uh, because it's kind of related. It's design patterns and all this stuff. So we'll talk briefly about principles just to introduce the DI. We'll do the discovery of the best way of implementing this requirement, which is how to increase the number of developers using DI. So we'll talk about dependency injection in that context. And then we'll talk about other libraries, well, C++ libraries, which, which can simplify some of the things which will be introduced by the AI. I don't want to go too much ahead, but we'll talk about some of them. So one of them will be Hyperdemic, Google Fruit, and Boost AI. Uh, and we'll sum up afterwards. I'll have a lot of points and a lot of slides. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll try to go quicker about uh, through some of them. Some of them I'll you know, try to dig in a bit more. But if anything, I would like you to remember everything which is dark, blue, which has dark blue background, because that's what I found in you know years of using DI and you know seeing how it's used. Uh, the most important part to to know. Make sense? Okay. So briefly about design principles. We won't spend a lot of time on that. Uh, so the only way to go fast is to go well. That's a quote from Uncle Bob, which I think is really important uh, when you think about the good design patterns. Has everyone seen, read that book? If no, I really encourage you because it's a very good read for improving your you know, design, software design skills. So yeah, really encourage that. It's not really related to, it's in Java, but if you, it, it's like, language agnostic. So when I talk about design, I will have three main concepts in mind. The first one being 
it has to be flexible because nothing in software development is actually certain besides the bugs. I guess the bugs are quite certain, everyone is doing them. And that the requirements will change because, uh, you know, all the stakeholders will always change the requirements. Even if you, you know, set in stone what you have to do, at some point you'll have to change that. So that's certain. Also, we will talk about being it scalable. So easy to extend, maintain, and reuse. Therefore, we'll talk about, you know, DI, because that's one of the reason we would use it. And we'll talk here about, you know, large scale development, which is like kind of like Google scale, where it's like hundreds of millions of lines of code. Uh, and so that's, for example, how it looks. Uh, and I actually talked to Titus uh, Winters from Google. And because Google doesn't apply the mm, dependency injection, they didn't start from it. But uh, his point was that if they had a good framework and they would start from scratch, they would actually uh, consider it as a, as a valid point to, to do the software development. So I think that shows a lot. But you know, it's obviously case by case. And the last but not least, testable. We always should put test uh, if you, if you like the code we actually have. <laughs> so it's the billion serials also from Google. So it's really important to remember about it. Make sense? So the last remark is like clean code defines the solid principles. Uh, but they are also, uh, you know, on the other spectrum, stupid principles, uh, which we don't want to follow. We want to be on the left side here. Uh, sometimes we get to the right side, but we don't want to be there. So I'll try to focus on the highlighted part, which is underlined, the single responsibility, dependency invention, and kind of bust the, the right one, which we don't want to really have. OK, so uh, having the, you know, the principles in mind, let's dig in to find the best way to implement this requirement, which we introduced in the beginning. And we want to focus on those guys. So at first, we can keep it simple, stupid. So as I pointed out, stupid is uh, something which we wa want to avoid. So if we approach it from very simple kind of scripting language perspective, uh, we won't get too far, in my opinion. So the easiest way to kind of implement it is to have like some main function and global functions using uh, being used in the and you know just ask the you know attendees before and after the talk and if the number of attendees willing to use the AI has increased that's great otherwise not so much but oh well uh, but we have to re always remember that code is m much often read when it's actually been written so we we don't write that much code as we read so you know i pointed out Things scale, so that's like a really simple example because it's you know presentation and we have some you know limited space on on the slides. But imagine that we have hundreds of thousands of lines of code of that, and you know dealing with that we don't want that. So I consider that stupid, uh, not very simple. Is that code flexible? Well, not really. It's tightly coupled. Is the term which we'll you know use very often here. Is it scalable? Not really, it's really hard to extend. Imagine that you have thousands of lines of code, one function main, and try to add something to it. Well, good luck. Is it testable? Well, not really either, because it's you know all in main. It's not testable from C++ kind of perspective. You'd have to go to like some scripting. It's a mess. It will be difficult. So the first thing, let's make it somewhat testable. I mean somewhat, because it's still, it won't be perfect. Uh, and by that, I'm, I'm I'll be talking about behavior-driven development, which is like BDD. Just a small remark, how we can do that. We can just implement uh, the, the steps for, for the requirement we had. Uh, so assuming there is a talk, so we have one, uh, one class already, which is a CP now talk, which is a system under test, and that the talk has been given, so we kind of run whatever. Then the result of it, which is the result that the number of attendees has increased, trying to, you know, willing to use the AI. Uh, 
So, so yeah, that's already better than before, right? Because we can test it in C++ uh, using some kind of framework. That's not really important, but it's already better. So in order to do so, we refactor it a bit. So right now, we just instead of main, we have a class which has the run function. And the implementation is still there. So you can imagine that we have one class and thousands of lines of code into, into the run function. It's a step. In my opinion, the right direction, but it's not really a big step, a small step. So you know, the first good thing about it is that we should consider test driving the code because, well, it it, it you know it put us in the right direction of of the design we will have. And just to talk about the BDD and TDD, the difference here is the fact that the BDD is the thing which you know. Uh, tell us how to build uh, the right thing, but it doesn't tell us uh, how to build it right. So that's TDD. So you can still have BDD, let's say, end-to-end -end tests and thousands of lines of code into, main into this one function. And that's BDD because we have all the requirements satisfied. But since we didn't follow TDD, it's not really right because it's you know, coupled and it's hard to extend. So following on that, let's make it more flexible. In order to do that, let's introduce single responsibility principle. Uh, is everyone following it? Yeah, most of the audience. So quickly about it. Uh, it's basically that a class should have only one reason to change. Otherwise, you know, it, it's doing too much. It's too difficult to, to reason about it. And it's a mess, hard to test, tightly coupled. So if you follow to our example, we have a speaker, and you know the responsible responsibility of the speaker will be to give a talk. Let's say, uh, as you can see, it's still tightly coupled here, but it's like it's still because the Chris is coupled to to the speaker, the name. But we'll get into that a bit later. But the idea is that there's one responsibility. There's no other stuff about you know, like attendees who you know, supposed to attend and participate and maybe ask questions or whatever. So we have these responsibilities, which is better than just have one CEP now talk, right? Because we can test them somewhat in isolation. So speaker and attendees can be, you know, tested in isolation. What about CEP now talk? Well, we'll kind of couple them to, to to the talk, so we'll you know have the member variables, and then we'll just run. So here we still don't use dependency injection. Uh, we have member variables which are coupled to the CP now talk, but it's still the design is still better than before because we can test speaker and attendees in isolation. However, the CP now talk has to be tested as a whole. So when we test the CP now talk, we'll test the speaker and attendees as well. Which is not ideal from TDD perspective, but it's okay from you know overall design uh, at that at that point. So is that code flexible? Well, it's more flexible than it was before, but it's still tightly coupled because speaker and attendees were coupled to uh, uh, to the talk. Is it scalable? Not really, because we often have to repeat ourselves because this, the crease was coupled to the speaker. So if you have different speaker, we have to create different class. Is it testable? It's sort, sort of testable, but it's not ideal because we can test speaker and attendees in isolation, but we can't test CP now talk uh, using fakes, for example. So somewhat better, but it's not ideal. But we still want to follow the, the rule because it's good uh, from the design perspective because it gives us you know, better isolation. And all in all, it's better than having just one class, right? But what about this coupling? And that's where actually dependency injection can be introduced, I think, as a first step. So it's often you know, this scary term, as I said. A lot of people feel like it's CMake kind of thing or whatever, but it's not. It's quite simple, and that's the you know dark blue background. So, if anything, remember that slide at least. 
from, so from the design perspective, DI is just about reducing the coupling. Uh, the less coupling, the better from the software development. So that's the way of doing it. But what is from the C++ perspective? It's actually just constructors. If you use constructors, you most likely use dependency injection. Woohoo, that's, that's all. Thank you for the talk. Uh, <laughs> it's a very simplified version because whether you use DI correctly depends on what and how you'll, what you'll pass into, that, on, into those constructors. You can totally screw it up very easily. DI has a lot of gotchas which uh, we will try to show and avoid. Make sense? And very important, DI doesn't imply a library or framework. It, it's very common, uh, confused that, uh, you know, containers like DI containers, they called, they coupled to DI, uh, like dependency inversion principle and stuff. No, that's not true at all. You can do DI without any libraries, frameworks whatsoever. It's just manual DI. There are benefits of using frameworks, which we will discuss, but it's not really the requirement of having it. So let's revise up again. We have this tightly capping no, no DI, CP now talk. That's not perfect. How we can, you know, introduce a better design. Let's start from a simple one. Name. Let's decouple the name. Instead of having it coupled to, to Chris, let's let's, you know, add a constructor. Yeah, the DI for you. In all glory. Uh, very simple, we have, you know, speaker which takes the name as a parameter. Very simple approach, but changes everything. It's actually a very powerful concept. So what, what about the, the talk? So here, just, you know, a slide, two slides ago, that was tightly coupled because we didn't have the constructor. But if you introduce a constructor, at least we can decouple them. Somewhat. We still use single responsibility principle and we don't depend on abstractions, which we'll get to, but it's still better because speaker right now and the name of it is decoupled. Make sense? So DI is often uh, you know, referred to a Hollywood principle. Don't call us, we'll call you. So it means we inject stuff instead of asking for stuff, which is always better, always. But when we have DI, we introduce this wiring thing, which we uh, talk in, uh, we'll, we'll talk and discuss what it is in a sec. But it basically, we kind of move the idea of constructing things inside the class, outside, so that we move that responsibility, not to deal with it, kind of move the problem outside. Uh, but you can see that like speaker and attendees will be created outside, and then we can you know, inject them, inject this like, pass them to the constructor. And uh, there's no merging into that. So wiring, yet another thing to remember, separates the creation logic from the business logic. So we don't want any you know, raw, uh, make unique, new, any of these goodies in, in the business logic. Uh, because that's where the logic sits and where the you know, creation of all our objects sits, it's totally different place. And that's the, the wiring place. Wiring has negatives as well, but for now, I think wiring is like the step into the right direction if it comes to design. And regarding to that, the composition route, which is kind of similar to the wiring pin, is a unique location in application where the modules are composed together. So preferably in your application, you would like to have the main, short main, basically, which constructs everything and after that you just run the application. So that's the, like the perfect you know, design from DI perspective. And I think it's like really good software de development practice because uh, you, know, you can easily change the wiring for the production, for the testing, and everything is in isolation, easy and easy to extend and flexible. So if you have something like the following that the, in the run call, we create the attendees, that's bad. If we create them like that, partially, like speakers created in the main, but attendees are created in the run, that's, that's bad. Good is pass the speaker and attendees to the track. 
So we get the immediate benefit of using you know, the DI this way. We can, for example, create two different tracks and run them in parallel, for example. A very simple immediate benefit, which is already better because our design without any changes is less coupled to, to implementation. But there are tons of gotchas with the AI, which we'll discuss right now. So the first one is not using constructor consistent, cons consistently. So for example, if you have a speaker, and speaker actually has a constructor, but we don't pass the speaker via CP now talk, then we introduce this coupling again. So let's not do that. Let's pass the speaker into the, the, the talk instead. So we want to you know, always be consistent about passing it. When we started from it, let's do it all together. So that's bad, but that's good. So that's coupling and that's not coupling. That's the difference. Singletons, yeah, singletons are you know, always bad, basically. They are really difficult to test, uh, difficult to fake. So we don't really want to see code like that when we have like speakers, instance, get, blah, 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 Chris, talk. It's really difficult to test, and that's not really a good design. The, the only way you can use singletons is if you inject them uh, via the constructor, because then you can fake them and, and, and deal with them somehow. It's still not ideal, but uh, if you really want to follow them, uh, go for it and just inject them. Just don't do that, because that's really coupling our implementation, and it's really hard to test. You have to you know, do like linking magic or something to make it happen. Make sense? So yeah, as a rule of thumb, let's avoid them. So that's bad, but well, that's good. So as I pointed out, when we inject stuff, it's always good because we can, we can uh, reason about it. One of the most important mistakes and gotchas which I found uh, is being made when using the eye is it's called carrying dependencies, which in which when we have the talk and we have the speaker which takes the name, that, you know, it's still maybe not coupled. Maybe we'll pass the speaker as the constructor, but no. What we'll do, we'll pass the name instead. We'll pass the name to the talk, and the name after that will be passed to the speaker. Well, that's bad because that's a leaky abstraction, and that, you know, maybe in this silly example it's not terrible, but imagine that, you know, pass through all the you know members to all your uh, you know other you know dependencies you have that's very difficult to test that's not a good design and i bet it's very common and you see that like you know you're passing something which you don't use just to pass around to the dependencies you they may use that uh, that's that's not a good design that's you know asking for troubles in the future so yeah important one because very common misused let's pass you know the objects instead of dependencies which are required by the underlying objects because that's not good so that's bad but that's good uh, passing speaker is always good passing the name and through the talk that that's not a good design we can also do it a bit worse with inheritance it's kind of the similar case but it's often you know very common in java that you pass uh, uh you know in java you can't do multiple inheritance from the interfaces but like in c plus plus you can so you can imagine that you can inherit from speaker and attendees you know uh, you know exploit their apis but but you know that that's good that that's bad that's always bad because we have the same problem because for example we will pass the name to the speaker we could pass the speaker here and copy it to the you know, inheritance, you know, derives class. But the problem is that like, we still, you know, rely and couple to the speaker because of the API of the speaker. So we don't want to do that. And especially we don't want to, you know, collide with attendees if they have the same interface. So let's not follow that. And, you know, as a, as a thumb of rule, we always prefer composition over inheritance. So that's bad because we coupled. That's good because we less coupled. Yet another thing is when you talk to your distance friend, yeah, uh, it's a good advice from Uncle Bob not to talk to them. You, you only want to you know, talk to your family, basically. 
keep, keep it close and tight. So for example, a, a bad idea would be if our speaker will get the manager and manager, you know, will get the speakers and we get, 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 you know, if you have a lot of dots in your code, it means you're doing something wrong with the, de with the design because that will make your code extremely difficult to test because you will have to fake multiple, you know, chains in order to get to the final thing. Uh, so distance friends, not good. Don't talk to them. So let's just talk to the, you know, immediate friends, which means that let's pass what we need for that object by the constructor. It's called also the law of the matter. Uh, it's a principal guideline. So that's bad, but that's good. So let's, let's follow that one. Yet another one is not using strong types. As you probably know, it's like that would be a weak API because we can easily mistake uh, the order and it will compile. It will sort of work, but it won't do what you need. So not best. Uh, and there's a really good talk by Jonathan, which I you advise to, to watch if you haven't, about the strong types for the strong interfaces. So we can introduce like a named parameters. And, and named parameters are really good with the DI because it's like you can inject specific things to specific constructors very easily with that. So the strong API, first name, last name being a, a types instead of the names is like, even if you have the header and C uh, and the implementation, the names don't matter. So you, in C++, so you, you can screw up the, the names and, uh, and get really, you know, confusing error messages sometimes if you don't test it. And much better would be to have the first name and the last name. That would be okay. And that would be in compile error. So that's great. And you can also find that designated initializer in C++20 may sort out, sort of, sort, you know, fix that problem. However, you can misuse them as well if you use aggregate initialization instead. So it's not a, a silver bullet. So let's consider using strong types because they improve our design. So yeah, so that's that's bad. That's good because we have. You know, uh, we have the ty types instead of the names. OK, so moving on. Let's make it even more flexible so far. Because li right now, it's like single responsibility give us quite a bit. But it didn't give us too much because we couldn't easily fake it. We couldn't test it. We, we kind of were coupled to, to, to specific types of the speakers and attendees. And that's not extremely good. For the, from the design perspective, because if you want to extend it, uh, it's not really uh, that easy. So is everyone familiar with dependency inversion principle? Most of uh, you guys, some, some of. So basically, there are two things about the you know, higher level models and low level models. But, but the idea, the main idea is that we should depend on abstractions and not the implementations. So we don't want to depend on the you know, concrete implementation of the speaker and attendees. Instead, we, we would like to depend on abstractions. So that kind of leads us to make sense. And it's kind of you know, a good rule of thumb because we can then fake it and test it. We can easily switch it. It's like we won't have just one type of speaker, right? There will be like boring speaker, uh, keynote speaker, regular speaker, uh, and so on. But that leads us to polymorphism. And in C++, there are tons of ways of doing it. It's like in Java, we'll just say, I don't know, inheritance, whatever, interfaces. But in Java, in C++, we have like inheritance, it's like object-oriented design. We have type erasure. We have variants, templates, concepts, and so on. So there are a lot of ways of achieving DI, which is you know passing the right things to the constructors. So let's take a look quickly into them. The first one, the most obvious, will be you know object-oriented design in C++. We have this virtual function, virtual abstract class, with you know we can put put constructor on it these days. Maybe in some compilers, sometimes works. Uh, which is basically an interface, right? Everyone knows about it. It's always important to remember that we need to put this virtual destructor 
uh, but oh well, that, that's the thing. And then we can just have the regular speaker uh, and just you know override the, the talk function. It's important to understand that it's actually introduced coupling because we can't use the regular speaker without this interface. So there's a small coupling with the, uh, with the interface and the implementation, which is not ideal and we'll try to remove that at some point. So then we have to go to the heap, we introduce the smart pointers and all these goodies, goodies, I'd say. Uh, and our constructor changed a bit. We have, you know, speaker-like, attendee-like, remove it or copy it, whatsoever. And our wiring, so that would be the common theme. We make, unique, make, shared, and pass it through. And we just run it. So it's basically as before, but we're less coupled right now. So that's good because right now we can actually introduce fakes or different types of speakers. So the design has improved. But, you know, inheritance is the base class of evil, so let's not do that. Uh, you don't have to, you know, take my word for that. You just watch that talk and I guess you'll be convinced by Sean. So let's not consider using inheritance for dynamic polymorphic. That's like a rule of thumb for the good design. Let's use, for example, type erasure instead. We can use the, the simplest way of using type erasure in C++ would be just a std function. Uh, and instead of having classes, we'll have just functions and lambdas. And it's basically the same idea. We have a function for the speaker talk. We have a function for CP now talk, and so on. So that's kind of a common theme as well, that is like DI is only object oriented, related, but that's not true. We can use DI with functions, we can use DI with templates, and we'll take a look into that as well. Just you know, to remember that it's not always true. And one of my favorite talks about functional programming is by Scott. And he actually described the solid principles from functional perspective. So object-oriented patterns, it's like there are a lot of names. There are quite a few good ones which we talk about. Single responsibility principle. Well, equivalent in functional programming. Well, a function. Uh, dependency induction principle, also a function. Everything is a function because it's a functional programming. So we can follow that approach as well. So and we can do the DI with it as well because function we can inject another functions and parameters into functions. So it's still DI. Uh, the constructor here is kind of the function parameters. And we can use like bind and you know pass you know some parameters into that and call yet another function out of it. So there are options here. And the wiring here will be when we have the talk, we kind of bind the names and we then we can you know call the talk without explicitly call the members uh, like names. So it's basically like having a class with the member variables or something and pass them through. And ask will just call the other function. The track will call one of those functions. It's basically the same idea just with functions. And that might be done with DI as well. So that's still DI. We can also follow type erasure in general. Uh, and type erasure, the, the idea is that we won't have the inheritance here. So we're not coupled to the interface anymore, which is good because not, not having this coupling is better. Less coupling is always better than more coupling. So having that, we can use, for example, virtual concepts. That's just the idea uh, for a pro from a proposal a few years ago, which probably never happens, but I just liked it. So uh, virtual concept is basically the idea that uh, we have the type erasure thing, which is just a pointer to a function and void star to keep the you know, data in it, uh, like a CD function does. Uh, and, um, and being able to use concept syntax to, to define the function signatures. But the idea is very simple that we have the virtual instead of uh, interface just for the members. And that would do uh, the type erasure behind the scenes. That's not very important for that talk. The idea is that we can do the type erasure somehow. And then we pass the, you know, the type erased thing uh, into the constructors because we follow the eye. So that's pretty cool. And then we do the wiring. 
uh, as before, basically. We always have to tweak it a bit because it's wiring. So we have to you know, uh, tweak uh, the fun uh, you know, constructor parameters if the order is different or the types are different, whatever. But it's always the case. I, I, I'm pointing this wire, wiring because that will be a, uh, an important thing in the end. And that's not C++. Variant, we can use variant. Uh, we can have the same uh, speaker without the inheritance. Great, we can reuse that. Uh, and then we have the variant from you know, all the possibilities which uh, we can have for the speakers. It's, so this principle is kind of closed for uh, you know, fakes, unless you add any, for example. I, I don't know. You can do some things with variant, but uh, in principle, it's, it's quite difficult to extend. Uh, but the idea is the same. We pass it through constructor. That's the main theme, if, if you haven't noticed so far. And the wiring, a bit different as before, but you know, we pass everything through, through main, we create the track, and we run it. We can also try to do more you know, compile time approach, kind of you know, if you care about the performance, uh, as we do. And we can follow design by introspection. Is anyone familiar with that guy? Not a lot of people. I really advise everyone from you know who is who cares about the performance in C++ to to follow uh, Andre ideas because it's kind of the evolution of policy by design. De yeah, it's really positive from the design perspective at compile time. But we can you know, follow, for example, static polymorphism and just templates. We still have the speaker, not you know, inherit from anything. It's the same as before, uh, nothing new. And then we just have the templates. But the important part is that we still have the constructor. So in the policy design, we would inherit from these guys and call you know, private functions or whatever. But that's kind of not that flexible from DI perspective. So it's better from that design just to use the speaker and attendees as a template which are injected by the constructor. Because it's DI. We care, we care about these constructors. And the wiring, as before, as before, blah, blah. We, we can use the deduction guides or we can just pass through the types. A bit different than before, but very similar. And most dependencies are now at compile time. So, and we don't want to pay for we don't use either way. So, might be a good idea. Yet another approach, concepts. Uh, everyone familiar with concepts? A lot of people are, maybe not that many. Uh, the idea is that we have these, you know, kind of an interface for, for types, so you'll get better error messages, faster compilation times, and you know, better descript description of, of what, the, what our types are doing. So instead of getting like error message from your library code, we'll get it at the point of the instantiation instead, which is always good because uh, we don't want to expose our you know, hacks in the library for the users. So that would be the con it's kind of the similar as uh, uh, object oriented interface for uh, for the ta for the speaker before. So the implementation of the speaker will be basically the same as before, just no inheritance because we don't have to inherit from concept. That's why it's much better than uh, than the inheritance on its own because we're not coupling to to the speaker like kind of thing. Uh, so that's positive. But uh, yeah, so, so the point is that it's the same as with type erasure templates. And, uh, and yeah, all in all, is that's very positive from, from our perspective. Make sense? So concept in 20, instead of you know, having the type name or a class, uh, we'll just put the template through it, uh, the, the concept. So, so the speaker-like and the attendee-like are concepts. 
uh, which we can also use the requires clause uh, afterwards. And that's not really important, but the idea is that the type name itself will be uh, a concept that will be verified uh, at, at that time. So how that will be read to DI? When you have the talk, we still have the speaker and attendees being templates. Uh, which have to be constrained by, by the speaker and attendee-like kind of things. And after that, we pass them through constructors. Nothing new, right? So the only difference between the templates and concepts is the fact that uh, the latter will verify the interface at the point of instantiation, and the former wouldn't. So we would get, if you use the speaker thing in the run function, and it doesn't have the talk function uh, implemented, then from the templates perspective, you would get a nasty error message from the run call that, oh, well, you don't have this function. I don't know what to do with it. And from templates perspective, we would get it when we instantiate the CV now talk that, well, the speaker which you passed through as a type doesn't satisfy this interface. Make sense? It's a positive thing. So when you, when you get your hands on concepts, apply them, because it's better than just the types. So what about the wiring of it? It's basically the same as before. We have the speaker, which we have to you know, create. Uh, and you notice here that like the speaker-like, it's, it's a is a concept. So before we would say auto, and auto is considered like the weakest concept you can you can have, which doesn't have any requirements. And the speaker like would be a concept which has to have the talk uh, method available for us. So it's you know being explicit is usually better than being uh, implicit. So so that's a good uh, good thing as well. And then it's the same for the attendees. Uh, and you know, we create both of them. And after that, we create the talk. We pass them through, as, as always. And we run it. Is there a question? So the question is whether we create some coupling by using concepts here. So the speaker like is anything which uh, you know will, will, be, will be constrained by the speaker like concept, which is just the talk call, like requires the talk method, right? So anything like regular speaker uh, will be satisfied by that concept, and keynote speaker will also be satisfied by that concept because it has the talk uh, member call, right? That's true, but there's no reason to talk that there. CPP not line three will get everything to you. Uh, could you repeat? Uh, the auto stack equals CPP not talk will make sure that the uh, the concept requirements are satisfied. All right. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, so, so the observation here is that if you use, sorry, it's like I didn't get it before. If we don't follow always auto auto kind of thing, then when we, when the con, the, the you know the constraint will be verified here, but it also be, be verified here if you put the speaker like on it uh, up front. If you put auto in it. It won't be verified there because it will be anything, and it will be verified later on. Whether that's a good on or bad, I, I wouldn't say that's coupling. I, but yeah, it, it's like, would you always put auto uh, on on you know on your initialization members, or or not? Yeah, it's it's like some people prefer it's a kind of like a style thing, I'd say. I I would I would feel like having a. A concept is better than not having a concept uh, there because uh, when we put auto, it might be anything. And people complain that it's often, I don't know what it is, right? It's not coupled at all to anything you passed, but people don't understand what it is. And they complain that, 
well, I don't know what it is, and I prefer to put a concrete type on it, right? But then it's like, it's just this type which you can create. With concept, the situation is a bit better because it's like an interface, abstraction, which is not a concrete implementation, but it's something which satisfies that interface, which is just the talk. So I guess there are pros and cons. Uh, I, 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 don't, I do not disagree that it's a bit of coupling, but I also see the positives uh, of using it that way. Uh, sorry, I, I can't give you any better answer. Uh, why not? Unless anyone else have thoughts about, should we put the concept name on it? Or it's better to put auto or, or even regular speaker on it? Maybe you can vote. Who is for auto? No one. OK. Oh, there's one, one person. Who is for a concept? OK. I would say half the audience, I guess. And who is for the, uh, the third option, the regular speaker instead? OK, there are some guys. Why? <laughs> Why would you use that? It, that, that's coupling, that's coupling. No, I'm, I'm just joking. Uh, I, I see the positives and negatives of all the approaches. So, so just to the you know, listeners, the overwhelming number of audience said concepts are the best. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. So let's try to make it testable. So our design is flexible, scalable, it's awesome. But is it testable? Well, we can actually do TDD, test-driven development, with dependency inversion uh, quite well, which is, which is quite decent. So let's assume we have a, a test. It's like simple testing framework here. And usually when you write a test, that's like maybe advice on the side, but uh, I think it's important to, to follow that. Uh, you usually want to start from the expectations you don't want to start from creating you know what i want to test it's what like how i want to test you want to you know say what i want to test so i want the uh, track run which returns the true if th that's from the test right should return true should return true if the number of attendees who are willing to use di increase uh, increases so i want to expect that i don't want to you know focus on how to how to do it that's the first thought in mind when I follow TDD. It's like, oh, I want to test that guy. And then, you know, it's like if you use mocks, fakes, whatever approach we have for testing. For example, we can use, you know, Google Mock, or if you use inheritance, or, you know, we can use fakes. If you use TypeBridge, or there are options here. I just, you know, pointed out the simple example when we use expert calls on our, uh, on our guys. And then that, that's the wiring part, which we talked through a, a bit. So we have to create the fake speaker, fake attendee, and the, and the track. So fake speaker and fake attendee uh, might be mocks, might be stops, might be fakes. There are you know, tons of options. And there uh, are you know, really strong opinions about what's the best, so I don't want to get into that. Uh, basically, it depends on whether, uh, whether you want to you know, do it at runtime, compile time, and you know, overall, whether you are object-oriented guy or not. Uh, but there are pros and cons of, of any solution, I would assume. But it's important out of you know, maybe this slide that test-driven development is good. And if you follow it, you will have a good design, uh, which is testable and which will most likely follow DI. Because it's kind of, it's like I'm saying less coupling is better, but TDD is kind of coupled to dependency inversion. So Maybe it's sometimes coupling is good, but yeah, in general, in design is not. So, following the dependency invection principle, is it flexible? I would say yes, it's loosely coupled because we are not coupled to the specific implementations. We're not saying the speaker is just the speaker or Chris. It's any kind of speaker we want. We, the only requirement is that it has to satisfy the talk number call. So that's good. Uh, we want that because then if our you know, product owner will come and say, I want this you know, awesome speaker right now. Uh, it's like, can you implement that, Chris? It's like, I'll say, sure, I can do that. And I don't have to change. And I can implement that guy, an awesome guy. I can test it, him in isolation. And I don't have to 
change any of the you know main logic, business logic, or anything like that because I'm loosely coupled. So it's good. Otherwise, I would have to change the implementation inside and just deal with it. And that's not what we want because it's not flexible and really hard to maintain. Is it scalable? Well, I would say no because of this wiring thing, which I kind of pointed uh, a few times about. I believe that the wiring makes it really not scalable. So if you think really scale, huge scale, like Google scale, and we have to create millions or thousands of classes, well, dependence, manual dependency is kind of difficult because the order is important. And we'll take a, take a look into that in, in, in a few slides. But for now, it's a question mark. And I, I would say no. You can disagree or you, know, you can even destroy me uh, after the talk, maybe. But yeah, definitely something to consider. Is it testable? I would say yes. Uh, it's much more testable than before, right? We can test the speaker in isolation. As I pointed out, if we add a new speaker, we can test it in isolation. And we can test the talk. That's something new, because we can test the talk by passing the fakes, as we pointed out, and, and, and test the you know, calls uh, and you know, make the you know, corner case cases uh, testable as well. Because it's like if we couple ourselves to the specific implementations, then when we, ta when we test from the end-to-end -end kind of integration test perspective, it's extremely difficult to get to the corner cases. And, and that's what you know, unit testing is about, the corner cases, uh, the documentation and finding bugs easily. Because if you, you know, follow just the BDD kind of end-to-end -end testing, then when we have a bug and it doesn't work, well, good luck if you have really huge coupling and trying to find the bugs is really, really difficult. And unit testing is really helping with that. And you will have a good design if you follow TD either way. So that's always good. So as a Good practice, I would say, considering uh, proper abstractions for your project, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, so for example, templates, concepts, if you know the dependency at compile time, just go for it. It's like it's C++, that's what we care about, right? No, uh, no overhead. Zero overhead abstractions are always good. And following, it, following them, it's a benefit from the performance perspective. It might not be a benefit from compile time perspective or you know reading perspective, but you know it's also C++. You you deal with it as as you can. Type erasure. Uh, I would say if you have a runtime dependency, just go for type erasure. Either std function or like in place function is actually better because it you know it lets you control the uh, small buffer optimization and std function not as much so performance wise it would be worse and it renews a lot of code bloat but it's still better than inheritance in my opinion uh, so for type erasure for runtime dependency i would go for type erasure and inheritance well although we have all these cons expert right now and it might be devirtualized uh, in, in, in some compilers, sometimes I would say never. Uh, but that's just you know my opinion. So uh, who listen to me, right? It's uh, I would prefer those guys before I would ever go to the inheritance either way. But it's uh, as usual there are pros and uh, cons of any approach, and I bet the people who who would say that inheritance is good and they would have good reasons for that. I'm not arguing with that. It's just personal opinion that I would never go for it. But, and I have my reasons. So all of that, it's so far, I guess, fine and dandy. We have better design than we had in the beginning. So the talk is going in the right direction, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but we have a problem. I think we have a problem. Uh, I don't know whether you have a problem. But uh, I see that all these solutions have one thing in common, which I tried to point out a lot of times. Uh, any ideas what that would be? Yeah? Dependency 
the dependencies are Right, so the observation, which is not what I'm looking for, <laughs> but is that that uh, the client should know about some of the dependencies. But yeah, that's a valid observation. And where's the dependency? Yeah, right. However, if we depend on the abstractions, uh, we kind of decouple ourselves from that, right? Yes, yeah, someone. Uh, any? Oh, I, I like I like I like that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. There's a there's like yeah, yeah. So a lot of people mention about the wiring. Good audience. Uh, no. So so the idea is that the manual wiring which we had, and that's what I'm trying to point out. And it's like I'm not saying that observation which was you know pointed out before is bad or something. I just want to focus on that because I'm I'm thinking like going to the right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The observation is that it's it, it's related. Uh, I really like this observation. So, so yeah, the ma manual wiring is the fact that you know we have to always we kind of move this problem from having it inside the classes to outside the classes, and right now we have to create all those guys and pass them through, which is tedious. Not the you know, this uh, it's not the best you know usage of the developer's time because developers want to focus on the business logic not on the wiring wiring is boring right who it's like who want to create classes uh, it's the same with the functions it's the same with the templates it's the same with the concept we always have to do that and uh, and it's not ideal it's not that you know and again think in large scale imagine that we have hundreds of thousands of classes which we have to create and someone has to maintain that code so we're saying it's like DI is so cool, but it's like, oh my gosh, no way. Uh, so we kind of introduce a, it's called the wiring mess. Uh, and that's like an example of it. When we have, you know, it's just go, go, go forever, right? Uh, it will have like so many uh, of those classes which we, which are different in production, which are different when the logger is enabled. Oh my gosh. Uh, and, you know, you know, you know what I mean, probably. So it's boilerplate and tedious. It's hard to maintain because the order is important. So if you, you know, switch the order of the constructor pointers, you would have to switch something in the wiring. Uh, not great. Could be better. And we have multiple configurations usually for the release, for the debug. All of that makes it like not something which most developers would enjoy. So. To remember, the wiring mess is something which we don't want to have. And how do we get there? We have this single responsibility, which introduces a lot of classes, right? Single responsibility, like tons of classes. Everyone's seen that. Uh, when we you know, open the ID and it's like we can't see how many classes there are. After that, we introduce the dependency inv inversion and injection. So we, you know, we pass them through the constructors. Great. And we introduced the wiring mess after that because, you know, the main was like huge, bigger and bigger, the, most, the more dependencies we had. So all of that get, you know, after a while, hard to maintain. And we have deadlines, as always at some point, we have the pressure. And what we do? We do hacks and workarounds. So we break the single responsibility. We break the dependency inversion. Uh, and all this DI goodness and constructors and all these ideas just gone away and we actually end up with being worse cut than before because we kind of followed the DI up to some point and we stopped after a while and we have this you know the, the worst solutions are the halfway solutions like like for example when you switch to different uh, unit testing framework and you switch it halfway uh, you don't want to just deal with that and that's what we don't want to deal with when we use the DI as well so but there is a solution, there is hope, there is hope. Uh, there are always frameworks uh, which always may help. So the main idea for the frameworks, and as, as I pointed out before, is like frameworks are not required for DI. We can deal with DI without the frameworks. It's totally fine, we just have to deal with this wiring mess. And it's totally fine just to deal with it. Uh, in the small applications, it's probably even 
easier sometimes, but in the large scale, you know, thousands, thousands of classes or even hundreds, it may become difficult at some point. So, so the idea is that if you have a good framework or a framework which can remove the, the wiring mess for us, that will be better. Well, let, let's check it out. So are there any questions related to the design which we have so far? Nope. So let's move. So there are you know, tons of solutions for DI libraries in other languages, and there are some in C++ as well. They often called also the inversion of control containers, uh, just you know, to point that out. It's not really important. So the goal of them is to remove the boilerplate code, the wiring mess. That's the goal. So all this, you know, creation of the objects and passing them through, you know, moving them, passing them, ma make sure it, all of that. Let's just, you know, remove that. And we can do that by, you know, frameworks do that by, you know, being able to deduce the constructor parameters, uh, deduce the object lifetime, and create the object graph for you. So we'll take a look into that how that works. But all in all, writing the I library is not easy in C++. I can tell you that because I wrote one. There's no reflection, so it's hard to deduce the constructor parameters. Uh, you have to do a lot of TMP magic to make that happen, but it's possible. Uh, we have all these R value, all values, you know, passing by the constructor, which is like, oh my gosh, what to do with that? Uh, so you have to have the object lifetime uh, dependencies, you know, get right. You have east const, west const. <laughs> DI has to handle that. And actually, we, it cannot care about it. And error reporting is like usually we create it, we create the objects, so we deal with the constructors because DI is about constructors, and you know that's the worst part if it comes to the error reporting because it's a constructor, so you know it's harder to use like uh, expect or something like that. Uh, usually, we end up with expect exceptions or are other problems. And we don't want to pay for what we do not use, right? So, so it's basically how to, how to make that happen. All, all of that is like uh, kind of difficult. And there are other problems. Uh, so there are a few approaches, at least a few approaches which I've seen. So compile time, that's, I think, is like preferable for all C++ code when we get the compile time error. So if all our dependencies are not uh, creatable, if you cannot create the CP now talk, we will just get a compile error. Yeah, that would be great. There's kind of a runtime compile time when we get the compile time error, but the backend is kind of uh, runtime. So sometimes we get exceptions, sometimes we don't. And fully runtime when we have like the you know XML kind of Java approach when we read from the XML and we can you know create objects or when you know if you don't have object being bound, we get exception and you know deal with it in production if you don't test it. But you know preferably we would like compile time errors, I guess. So overview: there are a few libraries. The first one is uh, Hyperdemic. Anyone familiar with that guy? There's the, there's one person. So it's header only. Uh, it requires a and boost, is 11, and is runtime. So we'll take a look into that. There's Google Fruit. Anyone familiar with that guy? No one. It's not people from Google, I guess. It's a library. Uh, it has Google license, whatever. Uh, it requires STL, boost is optional. And it's, it's this semi compile time approach, which is, you know, you get some errors at compile time, some at runtime. And there is a mine library. Anyone familiar with that guy? Yeah, everyone, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there are people familiar with it. So it's header only, it's single header, it's boost license, there are no dependencies, uh, it's all goodies. Uh, and it's compile time by default, but you can switch to runtime if you want. And it's not the boost library either way. Uh, it's just called boost, and therefore the brackets. Just a disclaimer. OK, so as I pointed out, uh, our code wasn't so scalable, in my opinion, because of this wiring uh, 
and was pointed out by all audience. Uh, so let's try to make it more scalable with, with the containers. It might not, I, I, it's like a warning, it might not seem more scalable in the beginning. So uh, just bear with me uh, till the end maybe, and we'll see some benefits of it. So for example, when we have the speaker, uh, so that's the implementation of object-oriented approach with hyperdemic. We have to switch to the shared pointers because that's only what is uh, uh, you know allowed by it. So that's not good, but okay, we'll talk into that a bit later. So basically, we switch to the shared pointers. That's fine so far. And after that, we have this wiring in which we have the kind of builder, and that's the main part of all the I frameworks. It's basically when we want to bind some interface, some abstractions to some concrete implementation. So, so that would be like very common across all the DI frameworks. Uh, it's just a different, you know, syntax, sugar. Uh, but the idea is that when we have the speaker like, I want it to be the regular speaker. Uh, and that's all about it. Uh, because DI frameworks, the good DI frameworks can, can inject, like create the object graph, which doesn't depend on any abstract classes just by default. But if you have the abstract classes, we just have to tell the DI, well, this guy is actually, I care about the other guy. I, I want it to be that guy. Make sense? And after that, we build and resolve. And it will throw if it cannot be found. So about Google Fruit, Google Fruit is very similar. It requires a macro to, to pass into your all constructors, which is not ideal. Uh, but well, we can deal with it, I guess. Although we have to kind of remember that DI is not a, is about reduced coupling, and but we couple ourselves to the macro, uh, a like kind of dodgy area, gray area, uh, and this is like pointers here, and you know the idea is that we have the macro and everything else is as before, and the idea is that we create the component, bind the again speaker like to regular speaker. We create an injector kind of thing, get the talk, and we can run it. So it's very similar to uh, to what we have so far. So moving on to the framework guy introduced. So the good thing about it is like we don't have to change the the classes. So all of them are the same. We don't change the constructor parameters or anything like that to adjust to the AI. It will deduce the constructors for us, which is good because it's less coupling. Less coupling is always good. Uh, and for the runtime, briefly, it's an extension because by default, the boost DI is compile time. But I just wanted to point out that uh, it might be at runtime. We bind, nothing new, right? The two things to remember, DI, constructors, DI libraries, you know, binding kind of thing. There's no much magic, and it will throw here when we try to create it. But with the I, we can also do it at compile time. So it's basically no different than before. Instead of extension, we just use auto, and that by default is compile time. And then the, the good thing about it is just if it won't compile, it means the, it, it won't compile if the binding is missing. So for example, if you miss the binding for the speaker-like thing, it won't compile and will try to give you a nice error message that you screwed up. So that's good. That's kind of scalable, in my opinion, because we don't have to bind all the things which are, are not related to, uh, to the you know, things which are abstract. There's a question? Is those concepts the central parameter? Right, so th there's a really valid question. Are those guys uh, concepts or Interfaces, whatever, what that is, right? Basically, and we'll actually take a look into that, and that's actually anything. Might be a concept, or might be, uh, might be a concept name, or might be an interface. Yeah. Um, cool. I, maybe this was an unnecessary detail, but I didn't. How, how where did things like the speaker name? How does that get injected? That wasn't right. So, so sorry. It's the it's a very valid question. What about speaker name and uh, and stuff like that? I just you know dismissed that for the sake of showing up uh, those guys because it would have to be passed through here for example right speaker or we could bind the first name 
to something, last name to something, or we could just pass it here as a constructor parameters. There are options. So it's not like, yeah, I can't do that. I just didn't you know, focus on that. Oh, I had another question. Right, so the question is whether we can have two speaker lag in the constructor. Uh, no. Uh, we would have to bind it to in like in context, right? Therefore, the strong types are really good for DI, right? Because speaker like it's not really a, that good a strong of a strong strong type, but if you have, you know, uh, it's maybe easier to think of it when you when we have uh, the first name and last name, right? Uh, if you have the two strings, it's like you would have a string to whatever and a string to it's like which one is which one, right? So yeah, that's a valid point. That's the not the strongest part of DI, but if you follow the strong types or context kind of thing when you say it's like the first argument should be like that or something, uh, then you can do it. So to sum up DI, the power of wiring. Let's take a look into that guy and remember that without changing it, we can actually go to uh, a lot of concepts. So type erasure. So if you change the regular speaker to have kind of a functional approach, we could, and you know, the wiring is, uh, the, the, you know, the idea is that instead of talk, we have the, the function call, call operator. And the main thing is that the same wiring, so the power of wiring with DI is the fact that without changing the wiring, speaker like to uh, you know, regular speaker, we can create it uh, so far with object oriented design for the interfaces and without anything changing for the uh, type erasure STD function. So I believe that's really valuable because then we can easily refactor the code, switch from interfaces to functions and we don't have to change anything. The wiring mess doesn't exist for us because it's the same. It's the same for type erasure. So if you use, we used virtual concepts before, but it's like to implement that I used like some library, poly library. But it doesn't matter if you have the constructor being changed for these guys, the wiring is still the same. So that's the main point. It's like the wiring doesn't change. Speaker like to regular speaker, attendee like to awesome attendees. And, uh, and the idea is that we just change our code the way we want it. So we say, uh, I want that to be a type erase type or that interface or that a template, maybe. So a variant, uh, the speaker like in this case is a variant uh, and attendee like is a variant as well. And what we can do, we can still create the talk with the same wiring. So the wiring doesn't change. So that's the main benefit of the DI frameworks because we don't have to change the wiring and say how to inject things. We just say, it's, you know, in, it, we, do, we don't express how, we express what. And that's really declarative way of thinking and that's really good because DI will deduce everything around and just make it happen for us. And if you switch from variant to function, it doesn't matter. It will just create for us. And that's good. What about templates? With just a bit of uh, change, when we put a name on it, so it's like kind of the default kind of parameter, the speaker like here. So that's kind of referred to, to your question. So if the speaker like was interface before, it was a class, and right now we just put a name on it, the wiring is still the same. So this time it's just a name um, because uh, is a type, right? So, so then it will be the template will be the CP now talk, which is templated, will be still created. With concept, we can follow the same approach and still make it happen. So, the wiring is still the same. That's like, I, sorry, I'm repeating myself tons of time, uh, but I think that that's very important to 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 grasp that the frameworks, the main benefit of them is that the wiring won't change and we get the benefits of you know, being able to change uh, different uh, you know, approaches 
without really dealing with the wiring mess. And that's what the frameworks are for. We want them to deal with that because we don't want. We want to do the business logic. Uh, make sense? No. <laughs> Oh, that's a really valid point. Uh, I think it will collide. Uh, so let's say the speaker like concept. Uh, I'm not sure whether that will collide. Will that collide? Is it, is it like for a declaration and a concept uh, a problem? I don't know. Uh, let's assume that this guy is called something else. Uh, but that doesn't really matter, right? Because like uh, from the wiring perspective, we still wire it the same way. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. And that's a really valid point. I think it will collide and it won't compile, but the idea behind it is still the same. So one point to consider uh, to to remember here is the fact that I pointed out that the wiring might be you know used for different approaches, which is good. And that's what we want because when we not coupled and we're not bored by doing the wiring mess. But it's often very, you know, it's like if people pass the CMake thing with the DI, when they think that DI is only about object oriented languages and it has huge performance overhead and it can't do templates, concepts, nothing like that. And that's not true. Uh, I think I tried to show that the I think I've shown that it's not necessarily true that uh, you know the containers can deal with concepts. They like DI. I didn't show that, but DI doesn't have any performance overhead. It actually can have and generate better code than handwritten manual wiring because it it knows all the types which have to be created, so it can you know create a, you know more cache friendly layout, for example. So DI is good as a framework. And there are more benefits, and we all like, you know, benefits which are free, I guess. So, refactoring with DI quickly. Let let's let's change the constructor parameters because that's the refactor we sometimes do, right? We change the orders, we add parameters, uh, the new requirements. You know, we deal with it and we change it because we have to. It 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 will be a part of it. We'll have to change something. So these guys are all different because of something. So manual rewiring is refactor for money, basically, because we have to spend time and money doing it, uh, because we'll have to change the wiring, right? Wiring mass, meaning construct it in a different way, change the order. So for the first one, you see it's like the second one is a bit different than the first one. Uh, it's a subtle difference, but we have to deal with it. It's like no one will do it for us. The order might be important. Uh, and again, if you think in large scale, <coughs> that will burn us at some point, in my opinion. It burned me a lot of times. So with uh, frameworks, we can actually just say create as before because the wiring, the power of wiring is the fact that it deduces the constructor parameters for us. And it doesn't matter whether it's a unique pointer or shared pointer reference, it will deduce the lifetime as well and hopefully do the right thing. Uh, but the point is that if you even change just the constructor order, uh, we don't have to change anything. It will just compile and work. And if you use the compile time approach, we even get a compile error if you screw it up. All of that is, uh, in my opinion, good. For example, testing. We pointed out how to do the TDD with DI. It's like all of that is quite neat. With, you know, DI framework, we can do it even easier than before. So we still have the same code. And after that, we just say make using some kind of mocks. So then the eye for the unit testing can deduce, oh, that's an interface or that's you know concept or type, and oh, I have to create a mock for that, and I can do that somehow. So for interfaces, there is like 
I, you know, you can do the virtual table magic to make it uh, happen. And for type erasure, you can easily, easily, easily mock it as well. So there are options to mock it, and templates might be mocked as well automatically. So all of that is pretty good for 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 testing. It's the same with integration testing. So let's assume you have this test. And you would like to change just just a bit of the wiring for the for the like production code. We have the production wiring, which is like you know hundreds lines of binding, but we have a database or something which we don't really want to you know integrate with in our integration tests. So we would like to change just that part. So what we can do, we can use the the basic. Uh, approach for the production injecting part, uh, sort of thing, where we bind everything the way we want in the production. And after that, we can just you know overwrite something which we care to fake in our integration test. So like attendees maybe is not the best example here. We don't want to you know, fake attendees maybe. But for example, if you want to fake the database or network or the time, that's like a logger, things like that. For the integration testing, it's like we just use the production wiring, and after that, override something we, you know, don't want to uh, use as a uh, as as the same as the in production, and then we can have quite clean uh, integration tests like BDD style. And the last thing is the qual quality and forming uh, enforcement. So it's often the case that you have like some different policies in the in the company that you would like to say, oh, we we don't allow raw pointers. I mean, it's like we better than that. So, so for example, imagine that, or something similar. We have like the talk free, which takes uh, whatever that is, and after that we have talk four, which takes a pointer to the speaker, like. Uh, and we would like since we control the whole object graph creation, we would like to say, do not compile if anyone passed the pointer through the constructor, because that's like against us. We like, we don't know whether that's owned or not. Don't do that, for example. So then we can just introduce the policy. Uh, I don't point out how to do it, but it's very easy. We just say, like, uh, if it's a pointer, the type which is given, just, you know, just bail out. And then we just get a compile time error for uh, the guy uh, which won't satisfy that that requirement. So, so far, the talk one, two, and three will easily pass through because they don't have any pointers. And all the dependencies which are dependent on, on them, uh, as I pointed out, the, the DI creates the whole object graph. So it's going through all the uh, the chain. So if you have one object and, on, and this object depends on other objects, the I will just deduce that and go and go like the whole object graph. But here, at some point, it will you know try to create talk for, and it will see that the speaker like is a pointer, and it will just bail out and doesn't compile because uh, we didn't allow it to. So I think that's a good thing from uh, you know design perspective because we can we can you know write constraints of, of what what we want. Make sense? So what's the what's the you know uh, point of all of that? I think the point is that, and I tried to convince you. I don't know whether I managed to do that, but the point is that uh, we should consider uh, using the frameworks to limit the boilerplate, especially when we do the large scale development in which uh, we don't want to deal with the wiring mess. Uh, because otherwise, we will pay a lot. From my experience, at least, I will just share that with you, that spending time on dealing with wiring mass when it's huge, it's, it's tedious, and it's not what uh, I would like to do in my you know, spare time. So if I can have a framework which will, deal for, uh, which will do that for me, uh, I'm, I'm a happy developer. And I can, you know, be more effective in what I'm actually doing at work. But there are gotchas. Uh, 
So let's go quickly through that. So using container as a global injector, we just come on. Uh, uh, it's a common case. It's a bad thing. We don't want to do that. So because we go back to not having the constructors and having the kind of the singleton. Again, don't do that with the containers as well. Avoid that. So that's bad. That's good. Always pass what you need through the constructor. Service locator, that's really bad design pattern in my opinion. And the idea is that we couple our source to the service locator, uh, which is just one constructor parameters, uh, which just has to be passed through all the objects. Uh, and we always pass it, and then we resolve what we need out of it. So that's bad because we couple ourselves again to something which, uh, which is DI related. Not great. So that's bad, but the passing speaker is good. And lastly, sorry, I'm going a bit fast. Maybe there are questions to the service locator. Uh, the idea is that we don't want to pass just one object through all the dependencies because that's coupling us to it. And we don't want to do that makes our, our life difficult because of the testing. Testing will have the God object kind of thing, which we have to mock all the, all the resolve calls. Uh, and we won't be able to switch easily uh, from DI, uh, fr one DI framework to the other because we couple ourselves. And lastly, we can couple ourselves to the DI framework, which is kind of mind blowing, but we don't want to do that. Because DI is not all about, don't couple ourselves. And after that, oh, but DI frameworks are cool. So let's couple ourselves to them. Uh, no, uh, that's bad. So for example, with Google Fruit, we have this macro. Uh, the reason why we have this macro is like, consider not to do that, if you can. Also, hyperdemic has this subtle coupling in it, which is via the share pointers, because it only allows share pointers. So you have to have to pass shared pointers into all the constructor parameters, which is not ideal. Because, yeah, it's C++ is not about the shared pointers only. So the point here is this. Let's consider not to couple ourselves to any, any framework. That's always good. Because then we can easily switch from one framework to another, to the manual where you know, if we don't like the framework, framework doesn't work for us. But you know, then we coupled, so we, we can't switch. So we, we screwed, right? So that's bad, but that's good. So to sum up, because we don't have a lot of time, good practices are good practices for the reason. Solid is always better than stupid. Dependency injection, loosely coupled code, related, good. Easy to test code, good. Wiring mess, not so good. Libraries, promotes loosely coupled code still, that's good. The wiring mess cleanup, good. Simplify refactoring with the constructor and stuff, good. Adding new features like the quality enforcement, good. Testing, even easier, good. Learning curve, not so good. We have to learn the frameworks and you know, there are gotchas with all of them uh, and even pointed out this talk. So there are pros and cons. So just to sum up, the main part of the talk, because we have like one minute left. DI is just a fancy term for constructors. It's a, as I pointed out, it's a $25 concept for five cents term. It's very simple if we follow. However, we can screw it up. That's another point. Uh, it can be easily misused. And it's often the case that, for example, the we carry the dependencies around, or we don't do it right, or we assume it has to be object-oriented design and stuff like that. So all of that make the DI really difficult to, to cope with when misused. So let's not do that. And I hope the talk helped a bit with do, doing it right. Important case, DI doesn't require a framework, container, library, we can do manual wiring as well. So DI concept as it, as it stands might be used without the framework. Framework can help, but it, they are not required for achieving the good design 
which is flexible, testable, and scalable in, in, in the term I, I, I introduced it here. The framework helps with the wiring mess. That's good uh, because dealing with it might be difficult. And I pointed out that a few times we always have to think large scale uh, if it comes to that because in the small scale kind of concept, maybe you won't see that problem. But in the large scale, it's probably a case. So yeah, and we have no time. So let's just integrate all the things. And uh, thank you very much. I guess I can take questions uh, if anyone wants to. Is there a question in the back? Yeah. Oh. I should throw that, by the way. <laughs> I was told to throw that, but I can't. <laughs> OK, so let me just rephrase whether I actually understood it. So the observation is that DI is fine and dandy, but may screw up the compilation times in general. So well, I did the comparison of uh, the boost DI uh, library versus uh, manual kind of approach, as well as versus Java. And it compiles faster than Java, for example, uh, which I find like the dagger to implementation of, of the uh, DI in Java. So I didn't see that problem. Uh, however, it might be slower, but I wouldn't say it's a, a blocker completely, uh, especially, well, at least with the Boost DI. I can claim that uh, you can easily create, I have tests in which I create thousands of classes and ask it to create the object draft for all of it, and that compiles in like no time. But I see your point, and I see that it, since it's templated and it has to deduce stuff, and it's like a lot of TMP magic behind it, it might be an issue uh, for some projects. Uh, so it's like, you know, I can't give you a really good answer. It's like, I feel like it's not a problem, but I see your concern. It might be a problem. So it might be worth not to do it if you have that problem, right? Uh, it's always, you know. Depending on the case and the project. If that answering your question? Yeah. Any other questions? So one, one issue I've often faced is when working with a legacy code base, you kind of do business injection somewhere further down the chain. And so you have this problem where you kind of have to pass the dependency four or five levels down the chain, or you have to refactor everything. Right. OK, so that's really val a valid observation. And the, the idea is that the problem is that, especially in the legacy code, we may have code which is tightly coupled already. And we would like to switch to DI, but we cannot really easily switch to DI from the bottom up, in a sense, right? Because uh, we would have to go to the composition route. And if you didn't design using DI from the scratch, well, that would be difficult because we have both approaches. And both approaches are never good. So. My comment to that, because I've seen that and I deal with that for a while, we can still do it in, in, in steps. It's like trying to refactor towards the composition route and you know one place where we create all the objects. 
the first approach would be just to be able to create all the objects using like singletons or whatever with DI. So if you have the composition root, which creates the you know, app or world, and it still is coupled, it's not ideal, but it can create it somehow, then we can, uh, we already in a better uh, you know, shape because then we can change the dependencies one by one. But uh, besides that, I can't give you any more advice. It's really difficult and it's a long process it, and it has you know, tons, of, uh, tons, tons of work to do uh, to do the refactor from the legacy mode to kind of more modern world. But it's possible. I, I think it's possible and uh, I personally did it a few times and it worked out when I approached it this way. So I could do the first step is I create it with DI, but it's coupled. Like I don't have these bind calls for everything because it's coupled, because I use singletons, because I couple uh, myself to like C code and after that switch one by one uh, as I go. Maybe to summarize it sounds like what you're saying it's maybe okay to go to that intermediate step. to get the object initially until you need to. Yeah. That's kind of your opinion. Yeah, that's my opinion. That's where I ended up landing. I just you end up with this weird hybrid, right? Right. Some you things are being passed, some are going to the right. object Yeah, it's a weird hybrid but you don't wanna deal with, but it's like, that. that's your, it's, it's really important, as I pointed out, it's like the changing the C testing framework to follow it through. Because if you don't follow it through, you ended up with this weird state when you have sort of DI, sort of none, sort of factory, some sort of, you know, manual, and then it's really difficult because it's not really easy to follow. Uh, but yeah, if you don't pass, pass you know, till the end, uh, it will be difficult, I agree. So, so the the question is, uh, if I have because I don't think that I actually haven't ever considered it this way that you have different interfaces for the production and the uh, and not the production code. They want nice simple interfaces for the consumers of the classes. They don't want they don't want to do all this wiring. They just want to say, I want to I want this art. And what the internal implementation is is irrelevant to them. They don't want to know about it. Um, but of course, for unit testing. Hmm. Uh, well, I never thought about it this way. I feel like uh, it's. Imagine standard string with dependency injection, for example. You want to do standard string. You have to then pass in all the internals in the constructor standard string to create the standard string. That would not be a very, that would not be a user friendly standard string. Yeah, but don't you just have, don't you just package up the Y plus your, you put your top level. That's what I'm asking. What's, what's your technique? The high level classes. Yeah. Well, that's pretty much what right. So. so so yeah, I think the the concern here is really valid, but it's like what you expose to the user, it depends on, on, on you. Like as a library implementer who is using DI for, for my library, I can actually expose the, the only interface I'm interested in and the details uh, I'm not exposing. So for example, if I have an injector and I say, the only thing which user can actually create is an app, they won't, the, the, only, the only call they will be able to do is create an app. They won't be able to create anything else, and everything else will be on the library side. So this way you would be able to get all the benefits of DI on your side, and the clients won't be exposed to that. So, so you can do that. It's definitely a valid point, though. That, but that kind of depends how to use DI, right, from, uh, from library implementer perspective. Uh, my talk was more about user perspective, uh, assuming that the library code is already there uh, and uh, did that. That breaking up also helps with compiler a lot. Each subsystem is different as injected, I guess. But then 
Right. So, so then, yeah. So the observation is that you can actually deal with the fix the compilation times, but uh, having, for example, CAP files for for your library code, and what you expose is just one bigger type which uh, users can consume. But all the details are in like CAP files, and you can test them in, within the eye. Any other questions? No. Thank you very much again. <laughs>